rights of the Christian church were deep and hard. They split and never were able to figure out how to make it work. And the struggle really was around whether or not Gentiles could be followers of Jesus without the men being circumcised. That's not a question that we raise today. But at the heart of that struggle was the sense that some people weren't worthy enough to be in the family of faith. Oddly enough, the very first followers of Jesus weren't pure enough, hadn't worshipped enough, hadn't sacrificed enough because they were poor outlanders who were not loved in the temple. And yet, when they get into power, what happens? It's almost as if it is written into our human DNA to figure out who is in and who is out? Who is better and who is worse? And then we like to attach God's name to it all. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with Peter's words. I will towards the end of the sermon. It was our intention this month to talk about the three great evils of society. The speech that Dr. King gave to a group of church folk, the United Church of Christ, which is now referred to. When he really began to change and to speak out on more than just issues of race and civil rights. Because he had begun to see that they were connected to so many more issues. Today, sociologists call that intersectionality. All the different ways in which people can be oppressed. Not as a way of comparing how more oppressed than you are. It is a way of recognizing that your struggle is wrapped into my struggle. And it is in that that we find empathy and work for the justice and healing of and so it was my intention on this day then to move from the three and into one that hardly ever gets talked about, the issue of sexuality. I mean, we are welcoming an open congregation, but how often do we really talk about such things? It was 1967 that Dr. King gave a speech that was called America's Chief Moral Dilemma. And here's the thing, as we look back and praise those, it was a speech and content that was not universally praised. It's because at this time, Dr. King had begun to speak out on Vietnam and war in general, and he made connections between racism and poverty and militarism, and frankly, a lot of people didn't want to hear it. Still don't, but a few more do. And when he was challenged, they said, when you speak out against the war, it will distract from the issues of civil rights and race and poverty. But Dr. King had begun to understand and to teach that they were connected. That anything which was harming the community needed to be addressed, addressed head on. He understood clearly the trouble that war brings. He said, and I quote, during a period of war, when a nation becomes obsessed with the guns of war, social programs inevitably suffer. Then people become insensitive to the pain and agony in their own midst. Sounds contemporary. End quote. When challenged about his decision to talk about other issues, just stay focused. He said, I'm against, quote, I'm against segregation at lunch counters, but I'm not going to segregate my moral concerns. We must know, on some position, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it public? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there are times when you must take a stand that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but you must do it because it is right. And the role of the church, the followers of Jesus, the role of the prophetic tradition of the church means that we must wade into territory that will be uncomfortable. The church, the wider church, is in trouble. And our children are in trouble. And because of these two things, we need to speak more as a wider faith community and here in this congregation. The story is coming from our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church are coming fast and furious. The worldwide cover-up of the abuse of children by priests. Stories of nuns serving as sex slaves for priests. 
I'm not just picking on the Catholic Church, I'm getting Presbyterians in the And then we hear the former Archbishop from St. Louis say that all the problems in the Catholic Church are because of the homosexual agenda, and I'm quoting his words now, because you know I wouldn't use those terms. Everybody needs a scapegoat when they don't want to deal with their own problems. Our sisters and brothers in the Southern Baptist Church are now uncovering a denominational wide sex scandal. And over this weekend, our brothers and sisters in the Methodist Church are trying to figure out what does it mean for the future of their denomination. And just because we made some of these decisions 10 years ago doesn't mean everything's all right. We still have to figure it out. And we are, as Presbyterians, not immune to such things either. I have served on administrative commissions where we have had to call ministers to account for inappropriate actions while acting in the name of God. And the truth of the matter is, in the face of all of these things, it's easy to look for scapegoats and the desire for easy answers. Can we just figure it out and move on? Or hope it goes away and we'll talk about other things. But silence, as we have learned from the, active, the HIV and AIDS activists, silence would lead to death. Real, physical death and spiritual death. I think the church has just not done a good job of leading on issues of sex and sexuality. Frankly, I've not spoken enough about it either. The truth is that it may have a lot to do with about not making people uncomfortable in general. These are things you don't discuss in polite society, I was told. Religion is one of them, by the way. We're a lot more comfortable talking about sex and until it comes to religion and sex. But here's the thing. Change will not come while we're comfortable. When's the last time you made a massive change in your own life when you're totally comfortable with the way things are? And by not speaking out, we are still sending messages. The overwhelming message is there's something inherently wrong and sinful with sex and sexuality. That our bodies are suspect and our desires must remain hidden or somehow dirty or unclean. Now here's the problem that we know of human behavior. If you deny something and push it down and make it taboo, it can lead to unhealthy decisions and harm for ourselves or harm for others. And in the end, the church with our broken theology around sex and sexuality can lead to an increase in shame and lack of self and somehow we see ourselves as inherently wrong instead of the loving child of God in the hands of our God. Writer and social worker Brene Brown teaches a lot about shame. One of what I believe she says is one of most of her wisest observations is this, she says. If you were to put shame in a petri dish, it needs three things to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. And this is unfortunately what the church has done with sex and sexuality. It is our legacy. We are silent, or we don't see that we have been given a God-given gift of human sexuality. So instead we are secretive about what a healthy sexual, sexual ethic could and should look like. So that when people stumble and fall, what we do has provided judgment and blame, and we watch the dumpster fires. And unless we come to grips with it, little will change. And people will be left on their own and to the whims of the market to, der to determine what a healthy and thriving e ethic of sex and sexuality could look like for all of God's children. Now here's where it comes home. St. Louis is the STD capital of the United States. Have you seen that? There was a moment when we were, it turns out the numbers were wrong, we still were. And we are failing at addressing the multiplicity of issues which has created this crisis. Access to health care, comprehensive sex education for our children, and access to family planning methods, as the pastor just said. Why? 
Because we know that works. Why? Because people are getting sick. And people are dying. And if our teaching and our theology or lack of leadership is causing people to get sick and in some cases die, it is time to change what we are doing. The studies show really clearly that abstinence-only education does not work. It doesn't. I'm going to get to the whole. Are you saying it's a free-for-all? No. And when things go bad, when people get sick in record numbers, what we do is we blame them for not being strong enough or being immoral. And frankly, that's just adding more shame and judgment to the whole issue. Blaming people as simply moral failures does not sound to me like the love of God in action. We already know. We know about the lack of equity in health care. And it is harming non-white children and others at a higher rate. The Missouri Foundation for Health did a study between 2007 and 2011. Here's some numbers. I know I don't always drop numbers, but this is important. And it showed the disparity between black and white folk. The rates of HIV infections were 9 to 1. Chlamydia, 11 to 1. Syphilis, 8 to 1. And gonorrhea, 27 to 1. We've got a problem. But to blame this on the people who are facing it is not just morally blind, but racist. I don't know what's wrong with that, which is what the healthcare community seems to be saying in some of this, or at least those not connected with policy decisions. This is a healthcare crisis, but it is more than that. It's a crisis of leadership. And the church can't simply say, well, you shouldn't have done that. We need to speak out, not to shame. We need to listen to what the folks who know what they're doing are doing. The healthcare professionals know how to address these things. And here's the thing, if it does not line up with what we've always been taught about sex and sexuality, then we need to figure out better theology. Because if our theology is leading to death and sickness, our theology is not God's theology. People are sick and people are dying. It's something blaming people is the lazy answer. So what have we said? Am I talking about tossing out the whole teaching of the Bible? We don't have enough time to unpack all of that. But if you read it enough, it doesn't give us a lot of good guidance. Marital rape is really not seen in the Bible as a bad thing. It doesn't exist. But I think most of you have known me long enough to know that I'm about, not about to throw the Bible out. We, in fact, need to go back. And we need to look at what the Bible has taught and the ways in which the church has interpreted what is being said. And when we do that, what we will find is that for a long time we've been misled. Whether on purpose or because of ignorance of the origins of the teaching, we have to recognize that we've can canonized some parts of the Bible and then make excuses for the others. Let me give you an example. Jesus says, love your enemies. We bomb them, so there's that. Jesus says, give everything you have to the poor, then come and follow me. And the church says, well, that's just too hard. Jesus didn't really mean that. But when it comes to passages about sex and sexuality, we take it at face value and say, that's an absolute. Except. And it leads to theologies like the Bible said it. We'll love the sinner and hate the sin. And then we continue to exclude and harm all sorts of folks, particularly the LGBTQ folk, but as well as all the folks who don't fit in this model of perfection. And while today's sermon is not intended to unpack all the clobber texts, those texts we use to say, well, you're wrong and going to hell, we don't use them for Presbyterians, but you know what the thing to know is that the scholarship shows that what we've been saying about them isn't what's really there. And it's going to require us some deeper work to go, oh, everything that needs to be said and learned cannot be done in a sermon, at least one that you'll stick around to hear an hour and a half later or more. In fact, it can't really be done in a sermon. It can't be done in a sermon series, and it's going to take more than just one voice to do that. 
faith and work. We all have to. So I can't be the only one talking. We need to talk more as a congregation about what we believe, what we don't understand about all of this. And it cannot be rooted in anything other than the love of God in Jesus Christ, who never really said much about sex and sexuality, but he certainly never excluded anyone for any of the reasons that the church has used historically. Jesus was silent on it all. Love your neighbor really was the highest command. Likewise, let me say this too, just because someone is married in the traditional sense, the church then remains silent too on that. We don't talk about what does it mean to have a healthy and loving and just relationship with another person. For far too long, we're like, well, you fit the default, we're done, how do I have to worry about that anymore? For far too long, the church has remained silent on the evil of marital rape. In fact, the church has said little but to reaffirm oppressive gender roles and doing everything in its power to keep from developing a healthy sexual ethic. And that needs to change. Now, I'm not going to lie down today because there's too much to be covered. However, it is time for us to talk about it. And I'm hoping this becomes the catalyst for helping us do some of that. To talk about what a healthy sexual ethic would like, it can't be determined by shame or self-hatred. It's not built through the lens of the advertisers that tell us that if we aren't young enough or thin enough, that we are entitled to enjoy ourselves and the wholeness of God that is given to us in life abundant. Now what we know is this work will not be easy. After all, I hear we have learned really well what is right and what is wrong and anything which does not fit in it, we will resist with our whole Let that be our God. 